people often think big church, you've always got enough people in ministry. So, you know, why do you even need to think about this sort of area? Uh, well, of course, that's a myth. You've never got enough people in ministry. Uh, and about 12 years ago, I was running, I was overseeing youth, the next gen, and running the evening church. But we, as a church, realised we, our blockage point was this whole serve area. Um, we needed to have a volunteer revolution. We were going to have to get lots more people serving and particularly the whole leading working in a way for us to get to the next scale. So I literally did move from the classic kind of up the front, all those sorts of roles, to behind the scenes. I'll get into it a bit later, but into the plumbing, you might call it. Uh, that's great. Now, Rep brings a lot of experience. So have your questions ready uh, for him. Uh, and he's very uh, you know, very helpful in sort of clarifying it so, so that you don't make the same mistakes that he's made. You get to make your own mistakes. Also got James Galea. Welcome to the Learning Labs, James. Thank you. Now, James, you are the Ministry M Pastor at Church by the Bridge, yep. a church just across the harbour in Sydney, and you also look after a number of congregations as well. Yeah, so two congregations on a Sunday. Yep. Right. Now, you're a, you're a pastor's kid, Yeah. so you've kind of been around ministry your whole life. What's interesting about uh, Church by the Bridge is that it's a collection of small churches that make a big thing. So often people think, Big, you're, you're at a big church, yeah, but yeah. really you're coordinating a whole bunch of small churches about under 125 people. Yeah, so I mean, partly that's uh, to do, I guess, our ecclesiology and to what we want church to be, but also to our building can only have max 120. So we've got now three sites uh, with uh, nine congregations on a Sunday. So you need a lot of people, a lot of uh, people serving and a lot of leaders. So yeah, keep you busy. Great. Well, I'm going to hand over to Rhett and uh, he's going to teach us. Okay, well look, I've got um, two main teaching blocks where I'm particularly trying to teach in a way that um, that creates, gives us the framework or the paradigm so that you can then diagnostically work out where your church is at and what you might like to do next. So what you may be familiar with is, is um, what we're talking about is we need to get an entire ecosystem working where, you know, where, where are we trying to get to? We want to um, have a making disciples ecosystem where the entire body of Christ is running that ecosystem. It is a picture, I think, of classic um, of 1 Corinthians 12, uh, where the whole body, if you like, is doing its bit, playing its part, where the different there's different parts in the bodies, but um, to the same ends. Now, if we move to the next slide, the particular serve area is concerned to see that that actually happen. How do we capture uh, the saints um, caught up running this ecosystem? Um, uh, that is the aim of the serve, serve purpose. You might call it a recruiting and training purpose, uh, where our aim is to mobilise, if you like, an army of saints. So together, collectively, we make disciples. Where that is, they are owning the responsibility for their bit in the ecosystem. Now, that actually is a key purpose for which people were saved. They are so, so that they would serve others as an act of worship uh, to God. Now, <clears throat> lots of places you go there, you'd be familiar. The, the, um, we're all called to, to serve, our, to love our neighbour. So you go to Ephesians 2, do you know what I mean? We're saved not by works, but God's workmanship, creating Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's that the general call of all the saints, to, to love everybody. But there's a specific work of the Lord where people are called into building uh, Jesus' church. You, you capture it quickly in, say, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where it reads, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. And the next chapter makes explicit what is that uh, um, labour in the Lord. Well, um, you know, verse Nine in chapter sixteen, Paul says he's staying in Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened for me. Timothy is carrying on the work of the Lord. Um, Stephanus is devoting himself to the service of the Lord's people. It's very specific that the labour in the Lord is the building of the church, both its upward and outward building, its getting and growing, um, making disciples thing that the saints are called to give themselves to. Um, on top of, if you like, just their loving of their neighbours sort of everywhere. What that means for us is we, we want people captured up informally doing ministry everywhere, uh, just as they have opportunity, but specifically setting up maybe formal structures where 
proactively, intentionally, um, people can be caught up doing uh, the Lord's work, putting their shoulder, if you like, to the ministry wheel. Um, I think the serve bit is, as a metaphor for me, a bit like the supply line in, um, in a war effort um, where we need to keep supplying um, fresh troops and officers to the Army, Air Force and Navy. And um, as modern warfare for the last few hundred years has shown, um, modern wars are won and lost on your ability to make sure those supply lines keep seeing um, the troops and officers get to, the, to where they need to get to. So <clears throat> that's the kind of the where, that's where we want this, um, this serve thing to be getting to. But of course, what's the now? Um, as we talk in Reach Australia, where are we at now? Well, the reality is most churches are at about maybe 20% of people actually serving in the church. That's the current situation. When you read into this kind of area, what you'll find is actually some churches can get it much higher than 20%. As high as 60% of people can be caught up in this work of the Lord in the local church and caught up with this, this gospel venture. Now, that's, that's two things that understand there, two things, massive. The first thing is that just that's a massive increase in raw numbers of people who are serving. And secondly, we are able to move our most able people from what I'll call self-evident work, um, just the kind of running of church, to what I'll call knowledge work, um, in particular the leadership aspects of church, training, those sorts of things. Now, I see those two things taking place, increasing numbers and getting people doing all these other kind of knowledge work, as causal to the growth of church. That is, they enable both the quality and the quantity of um, the ministry to significantly increase, which is, is causal to church being able to grow. So now that brings me to the next slide um, for me, which uh, apologies in advance for me. It's a picture of our ecosystem. Scott loves this slide. He tells me every all the time. Um, so don't be overwhelmed by all its colors leaping out at you and screaming at you. But the, the, the big idea here is it's, simple, it's actually a simple system. Um, we'll talk here about poetry and plumbing, or push-pull, um, where the, the poetry is the thing that I think most of us have uh, um, appreciated. It's the, uh, it's the, the preaching uh, from the pulpit, it's the envisioning. It's, that's the kind of context we want um, the the climate of um, the culture of church to be kind of going on, where people understand they're to be serving. But specifically, that the uh, the plumbing has these three key components to it. It has those purple arrows with a recruiting kind of bit to it. We call that the kind of a serve chat area, that recruiting area. We want to recruit people into ministry teams. Um, and the key thing to making those teams healthy is we'll need leadership. So it's actually despite the, what it looks like, it's actually a very simple uh, system and will work whatever size of church. Uh, at even a small level, this is exactly, this is a kind of a key framework that is helpful to have in your mind. Which brings me to um, the first part of that, um, which I'll call the leadership development area, which with reference to leadership. Normally I speak about, you know, let's get recruiting going, then teams, then leadership. I do it in reverse order. And I think it's quite, well, for obvious reasons we come, because I think it's whatever size of church you can get going in this area straight away. So I think we all straight away, with reference to leadership, I think we all know leaders matter, we, where they are important, both in the Bible and experience. I mean, the Bible, well, I've got so many places, but that Paul, evangelized church at, at Crete, he says to Thomas, at Titus, set up leaders. You need elders who are godly. They teach sound doctrine. And they manage the church of affairs, that or the affairs of the church, that is, they can lead. So that's the Bible. But even from our experience, if you need to run a youth ministry, well, somebody needs to take responsibility to make it happen, right? Whether it's you or someone else, someone needs to lead it. Um, it ministry always comes down to godly, confident leadership, right? Now, let's talk specifically, though, about leadership development. Now, we know leaders are important, but we often feel the burden of not having enough leaders. But the question we face then is, well, where are we going to get these leaders from? Well, you've got three options. <clears throat> you, you can pray for them. Great place to start. Hope they kind of grow on trees. And maybe, they, maybe they'll move into your suburb. Um, maybe they'll just bubble to the surface. 
Secondly, you could buy them, you know, um, but that means you've got to have cash. And even if you get the staff, staff have limited capacity, which will soon fill up. So you're left with your third one in the end, which is you actually have to make leaders. Every church has to make leaders, <laughs> which means um, that the problem, the lack of leaders in our churches is in reality uh, a lack of leadership development in our churches. The reason we don't have leaders is because we're not making them. Here's a great quote. You can <clears throat> bring it up on the slide and um, read it. It's from Malfurs from Building Leadership, which is a great book. I'll, I've picked some stuff out of there, particularly the first three chapters are worth reading. <clears throat> but you'll see halfway down the slide, it says, the solution to the leadership crisis in our churches is to do a much better job of leadership development, not the preparation of better senior pastors or church staffs alone, but development of committed leaders at every level within the organisation. A godly senior minister, pastor uh, and an excellent staff can accomplish only so much. The church's aim should be to train as many leaders as possible and to have competent leadership at every level of ministry. Right? So the problem is leadership development. So here's, some, here's kind of five principles um, to get leadership development happening. The first principle is if you want something to happen, you've got to have someone responsible for it. So you need someone to be responsible for leadership development. That's the first thing, and that's the foundational thing. The second thing is we need substantial enough ministries for volunteers to do so they can give leadership a go. This is a recognition that most learning happens through doing. Now, this is the 70-20-10 model of, um, of learning. The model says 70% of learning occurs through doing. 20% through interaction with others, getting feedback, debriefing, coaching. 10% learning through formal instruction. Now, the ratios aren't exact, and the shift is according to circumstances, but the basic principle is incredibly insightful. Most people learn by doing. That's why we have teaching hospitals where med students actually practice their skills and have oversight by training doctors. That's why TAFE students come out initially more competent than uni students. That's why we have, when we do student ministry, uh, we do student ministry while we're you know, studying at college. And so if we want to make leaders in our church, first and foremost, we need to give people a go. We need to have substantial enough ministry roles to really let them cut their teeth on. <clears throat> now, I start there because not only it's the main way people learn to become leaders of 70, but that <clears throat> is something that all of us can do, right? Um, all of us can give people a go. You don't have to have a fancy development program. <clears throat> the, the first thing, you just think about where are pl places we can get leaders going. Um, <clears throat> so that's the second thing. <clears throat> the third thing is, in order to give others a go, we personally um, need to have a kind of a, a shift in focus. We need to shift from being a doer to becoming a multiplier. So if I frame our goal as it's what I have to do, teach the Bible, evangelize, but, <clears throat> but and now I frame it rather as, actually, no, I need to be concerned about what gets done to get and grow hundreds, then all of a sudden we're small, we're inadequate, and we have to have a shift in our focus from being a doer to being a multiplier, someone who raises others up in order to see more ministry happen, to stop just doing a bunch of things and to train many others to do even more things. There's a qualification there. Um, there'll still be some inputs, you know, you may need to do uh, emails, teach the Bible, but how can you be training others and multiplying the work? Uh, now, that shift in focus for us, though, as leaders, means three things will need to change for us. We have to shift our, our values, our time, and our skills. So um, this essentially says that um, when you, as you change to being the leader of something, um, you're no longer spending your time doing the ministry, but equipping others for the ministry. Well, all of a sudden, uh, you know, you'll have to spend time thinking about how you write minute meeting agendas, running meetings, thinking about the ministry, giving feedback. You'll need to, you'll need to learn new skills, um, envisioning others for the ministry. Um, uh, and all sorts of, you may need to learn how to give feedback. And of course, the most crucial change is a change in values. You have to change your own values of not being the one who does the ministry, but who values others doing the ministry, um, which means you need to give up the need to be maybe to be seen or to be in control. So 
First principle, give people a go. Second principle, a shift in focus from being a doer to a multiplier. And then fourth, the fourth thing here though is we need to train leaders in generic leadership skills. Here's kind of a fancy leadership development program. Because um, uh, usually when we get someone into a ministry, we usually want to give them ministry specific skills. For instance, you're a Sunday school volunteer, they need to try and be trained in how you um, run the kids' Bible study. But all of a sudden, if they have to lead the volunteer team, well, that's a fundamentally different skills required. They have now, um, they used to have to relate to kids, run a game, run a Bible study. Now, they're having to communicate with the team. They're running briefing or debriefing meetings. They're giving vision. They're instructing team members on their role. They're giving feedback. What's been shown is those things are generic. They're generic leadership um, competencies. And whether it's the kids' ministry, the youth ministry, or the welcoming ministry, they're generic. And so, um, now that's not to say that ministry-specific skills aren't uh, important, and certainly in some areas, like in the band, of course they matter. But uh, these generic skills um, are, are crucial for leadership. And that is a big piece, that's the contribution, particularly of a book called The Leadership Code, where it's saying that 60 to 70% of, um, of leadership is generic. If we capture it up here in the ministry map, the big idea there is uh, you can see there's the, the discipleship piece. You know, we are concerned for people's godliness. That's the green bit. Uh, there's ministry specific things that we're concerned for, whether you're leading a band or a kids' ministry. But there's these blue bit, which is generic skills which um, we can um, then train for to essentially equip our leaders uh, to do. Um, and that's where in this leadership development area, we can provide training resources, materials and events to equip our leaders across the board in these things. And so uh, we run, for instance, training events two to three times a year where we get together team leaders, maybe area leaders, to do some training in this. According to the 70 20 10 principle, that is the 70, they're doing the ministry, um, but they're getting, they're with their, a cohort learning, sharing what they're doing with some 10% of some input. Um, now, we do that in all areas of church life. So, our MTS program runs according to that framework. Uh, our staff training, our staff meetings even run according to that framework. Um, 70, 20, 10. Now, um, the last thing to say, the fifth thing to say is you need to be measuring what you're achieving. So, how many leaders do you need? How many leaders are you making? Um, how many are being trained in specific training materials? That they, um, and put numbers to the questions. We need six leaders. We're currently only making two. And we have no people um, doing any training. Uh, and actually, if you track those sort of numbers over time, that's illuminating. Year and year on year, you can actually work on the leadership development system. So leadership development, um, make someone responsible for it, give people a go. Third, you become a multiplier, train in generic leadership skills according to the 70-20-10 and um, start measuring the outcomes. So I've got some questions for you there. And um, I think they're really helpful to, um, to start with. Are there ministries you're currently doing that you could ask someone else to, have it to, to do? Um, uh, for you to become a leader uh, and, or a trainer of leaders, what do you need to change with reference to your own values, skills and time? Uh, you might need to analyse what training currently exists in your church, third and how might you devise a leadership development strategy that one, appreciates the 70-20-10 model of learning and appreciates that 60 to 70% of learning uh, of leading is generic leadership skills. Well, we're gonna hear now from James. Uh, so keep those questions coming through. We are gonna have a longer block of questions. Uh, James is gonna uh, apply this for us. What does this actually look like in reality? Yeah, so just, uh, just to clarify, in terms of the world of ministry. Uh, Rhett, I guess, is what you call the Roger Federer. Uh, I am, am new to the game. It's just like I've picked up a tennis racket. So I've sort of uh, entered the world of ministry in terms of uh, as an official uh, ministry pastor about two years ago. And one of those years was COVID. 
so uh, I guess what I'm here in terms of just beginning to implement it, what I've done uh, and how to take a lot of the stuff that Threat's been talking about, which I've heard and wanting to apply. So I'm kind of going to share, I guess, a bit of my story in that. So I, uh, uh, in our context, uh, there was there's lots of good ministry happening. I presume in your context, uh, that's the same. And so, but what I noticed uh, that uh, kids were doing their ministry, youth was doing theirs, uh, maturity was doing theirs, uh, gatherings, mag, they were doing theirs, and all sort of good ministry, but all doing it individually, uh, almost very siloed. And I think that happens in any church, whether you're doing a purpose model, whether you're a congregation, model, just ministry tends to silo, uh, and everyone's sort of thinking uh, in their own uh, sphere, own space. Uh, so I kind of saw that and uh, basically was trying to work, put forward to uh, thinking in this area of how do we work together and how do we recruit and train leaders so that one ministry is not booming and while another is struggling. Uh, how can we work together uh, to uh, equip the saints for work service? And so the, basically a couple of years ago, uh, I went on a hunting expedition to find out how other churches do it. My philosophy is someone else has done it out there. I just need to find it. And so uh, I went to Building Leaders uh, Day uh, conference, uh, which was very helpful talking about leadership pipeline, how to do And whether you're a ministry pastor or just driving this, uh, I found myself kind of being a, like a language Nazi in terms of, uh, you know, we don't call it that, we call it this, and people will make jokes, and that kind of thing. But it was the beginning of us working together uh, as at our church, uh, if you are leading people, we call it a team leader. So that was the beginnings of that, and that was a couple of years ago. And I guess the in terms of the tangible uh, way in which that manifested was role descriptions. So again, I just went to another church, went to MBM, pilfered their role descriptions, uh, and they were generous enough to let me have them. And then I basically uh, took them and created a template for what do, what do we expect of someone who's leading eight to 10 people? Whether a connect leader, whether a welcoming team leader, whether a kids leader, what is the, what Brett was saying there in terms of what what's we expect no matter what uh, ministry you're in, if you're leading eight to 10 people, this is what we expect of you in terms of um, well, time commitment, uh, competency, character, convictions, those kind of things. Uh, acknowledging that uh, those skill specific things are going to be a bit different. So kids, there's a, obviously working with children, checks and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we had all on the same page, a template. So no matter what you, no matter what area of ministry you're leading, if you're leading eight to 10 people, you're a team leader, this is your role description. So that began then. So we had, uh, I guess within a year, um, a whole bunch of role descriptions that we were giving to recruit people as well as clarify. Role descriptions are just a breath of fresh air for the people uh, who are leading because they know you what you're thinking and they just give clarity and they're like, you go through it and it's just accountability. So that was, I guess, the journey we went on um, in that I've been on uh, in terms of how do we work together in having a consistent approach to leaders and then leadership development. Uh, I'll talk about how we develop leaders, I guess, in a moment later on, but that was the beginnings of that.